G'day everyone and welcome to the Walkleys Live as part of Sydney Festival. My name is Benjamin Law and it's such a pleasure and honour and privilege to be here with you all on the sovereign lands of the Gadigal. First Nations people on this continent, like the Gadigal of the great Eora Nation, have been sharing stories and knowledge here for tens of thousands of, of years and together they constitute the oldest continuing human civilizations this planet has ever seen and I'm particularly grateful to elders past and present that we can continue telling stories and sharing knowledge here on what is and what will always be Aboriginal land. Now welcome to the third session in our Walkley Alive series, The Journalist Gene, where we look at the award-winning work of eight extraordinary journalists exploring the national and international context in which their work took place, their influences and personal inspirations for their approach, and the professional drive, courage and values that sustain them. Basically what we're trying to do is get them to talk a bit about themselves as well as their remarkable journalism which is actually a little bit harder to do than it sounds because most journalists are probably happier being on the other side of the microphone and drawing people out and talking about their subjects. But as well as having our respected guests on stage, we also have the participation of performer Angeline Penrith, who is going to animate, dramatise and otherwise illuminate some of the background material to the work of these inspiring professionals. So it's more than an interview, it's less than an interrogation, we might call it a probe and a play, which I know sounds medical, but we're not going to go that far. Um, this series is a collaboration between the Sydney Festival and the Walkley Foundation. Uh, the Walkley Foundation celebrates and supports great Australian journalism, setting the industry benchmark for excellence and best practice through the renowned Walkley Awards. The storyteller in the spotlight today is Patrick Abood. Patrick's a Walkley nominated journalist, TV presenter, broadcaster, and award-winning documentary maker. Pat's currently reporting and presenting for The Project on Network 10, while creating an original eight-part true crime series commissioned by Amazon, supported by the Walkley Foundation after being awarded the inaugural Jesse Cox Audio Fellowship. In 2020, Pat did a stint hosting ABC Conversations, Australia's most downloaded radio and podcast program. He also heads up a team of storytellers on the new weekly ABC documentary podcast, Days Like These, and he was awarded a 2020 Walkley Foundation grant for freelance journalism on regional Australia. He's been working in screen-based media and radio broadcasting for more than 15 years, is the founder of Irreverent News, Current Affairs, Satire and Long-Form Documentary Program, The Feed on SBS TV, and has been the host of the annual SBS Mardi Gras Live TV broadcast. He's a native English speaker and also fluent in Arabic and German, has lived in Lebanon, Palestine, Morocco and Germany, and when he's not on TV and radio, you'll find Pat in the, in the kitchen cooking up a feast with his Middle Eastern family. Please make him feel welcome. Hey Patrick, hey, Benny. how are you going? I'm good. Good oh, to see virtual you. Virtual hug. <laughs> hey. Man, that's a very, that was a very large picture. I was, saying to Pat, large. I was saying to Pat before he sat down that when it's a picture of Patrick Abood, no picture can be too large. <laughs> surely, You're surely. too kind. Hey Pat, I've given everyone kind of a long spiel about the work that you've done because you've been working in this field for a while and you've worn many, many hats. But is it true that despite you know, all of that, we don't actually find yourself using the word journalist when it comes to you very comfortably? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd never really uh, described myself as like a traditional journalist, I guess. Why Mostly is that? because, well, I never really sort of went through the traditional route. I didn't, um, you know, work in a newsroom. I was never really a news journo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, didn't go through the kind of ABC cadetship route. I went to I studied communications, but I went to art school afterwards. Well, and when you say art, you actually mean like fine arts, right? Like, yeah. you know, people can get an arts degree, like I've got an arts degree, but you actually studied I was studying sculpture, art. like digital sculpture, so sound and video, um, kind of mixed media type stuff. Which begs the question, how do you go from sculpture to what you do now? Well, that's, sort of, that's I guess, why I never really described myself as a traditional journalist, more so a storyteller, because for me it was always about... Um, 
you know, mum's told me stories of when I was a kid at like nine or ten, where at family gatherings I'd have a tape recorder and I'd go and ask people <laughs> why they were eating what they were eating or, you know, um, what, what, why they chose to wear that shirt today, whatever it is, and I was always very curious. So, you know, thinking about those things, I was always interested in storytelling generally. Mm. And for me, it's the idea and the format that it takes doesn't really matter. Like, I think if you've got a really good idea, and you want to tell a story and you want it to have some kind of impact, you pick the medium that works best and you tell it. Yeah. So I feel like traditional journalism um, is quite narrow sometimes. I think it, you know, there's so many sort of definitive rules and you know, can-dos and can't-dos, whereas storytelling more broadly means that you're open to working in different kind of styles and formats, which I've always really tried to do. Okay, and so for you, does the idea of journalist or the term journalist imply kind of a more specialist beat and an approach to storytelling? It, it, it implies rigidity, which I've never liked. Mm. Um, I've always rebelled against that in every way, I think. Um, and not just for the sake of rebelling, but more so because I'm naturally curious. And I think being an naturally kind of, you know, a curious person innately. Um, if I find a great story, I want to be able to tell it in a way that I think is going to have most impact. And that's changed a lot. I mean, when I was kind of starting out, there, were a lot, there was a lot more sort of rigidity around, um, you know, what we could do, and it was going to sound really old now, but it was the beginning of social media and digital media and, you know, multi-platform content. So, yeah, I felt very limited at the time, and I think my thinking back then was that it was more so, hey, um, why don't I try making this, um, you know, telling this story in this way, um, because it'll have more impact, as opposed to, you know, sticking to writing a long-form article or sticking to making a TV package that, you know, has A plus B equals C. Sure, sure, sure. It bores me making it, so I feel like a lot of the time it may bother people that are engaging with it. So it sounds like what you're bringing to the industry are self-contained instincts, like that curiosity that you had a kid, or maybe busybodiness, as other people might have put it when we were growing Mrs. up. Mrs. Mangles from Neighbours. <laughs> um, but then what happened next? Because as I understand it, yes, you have the arts background, but am I also right in saying that you, you also worked in theatre and, and community arts? So how does that build into the kind of work you're doing now? Like, tell us a little bit about those steps. Well, th that's a really good point, actually. So, I mean, I did my communications degree. I did, I studied journalism, uh -huh. um, you know, and I did a minor in, in film and television production. And then I, I don't know, sort of maybe a year later, I decided to go to art school. And the reason I did that is because when I finished uni, I started working in the community sector, as you say. And I was really fascinated by the idea that there's these great stories in these communities that are not being heard. And they're not being heard because those people weren't getting access to, you know, the sort of wider media landscape. It was very white um, and, you know, very sort of, again, narrow view. And... You say that in past tense. Well, yeah, I mean, it's gotten a lot better. We have to acknowledge that. You and yeah. I have both had great opportunities. But back then when I was starting, that really wasn't, that, it wasn't the case. Mm. So my interest was, left foot in the community world. You know, I was working as a youth worker in community cultural development, doing these sort of storytelling projects with young people from, you know, all kinds of um, ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, um, you know, different kinds of sexualities, identities. It was really, really broad, and I loved that. That was mm. really exciting. And then when I started working in the media, I realized that if I have my left foot in the community world and my right foot in this kind of big bad media world, I can bring more of those stories yeah. and amplify some of those voices. And that's, that's sort of something I've maintained till today. Amplifying voices, stories that haven't been told before, are they the main prerequisites for the kinds of stories that you're going to bring to audiences? I like access stories, yes, mm -hmm. and I love um, anything to do with a subculture I'm really intrigued by. And it's, again, it's not because of this um, voyeuristic, uh, you know, desire for people to like look in and go, oh, look at that, that's weird and strange. It's more so that a lot of those communities feel misunderstood or mm. misrepresented or, you know, judged because they don't often have the scope or chance to speak really openly about, you know, why they're into a certain thing. Um, so. I'm always, I've always been really fascinated about getting to know those communities and kind of embedding myself within them and then trying to find ways to give them agency and make them feel like that they can tell their stories and they feel represented in a way that's really authentic. 
So we're talking about your storytelling. I'd love to see some of your storytelling, actually. And uh, we're going to play a video uh, now, but uh, you know the kind of results and the fruits of your curiosity, I guess. Uh, before we start playing, can you give us uh, any context or? Um, what it's a very old show reel. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's very reflective of what we're talking about. The, the things that really interest me and that really kind of. Uh, pique my curiosity is mm -hmm. stories that haven't been told, communities that you know we don't get access to, um, you know, and just ideas that people might have already made their or, or people that people others might have already made their minds up about, yes. you know, without having heard from the source directly. Mm -hmm. That's what really interests me most. Okay, great. Let's ha take a look at the video now. People say you don't get to choose your family, but for these girls, finding sisterhood in each other changed their lives. Kilia, Jamaica, Tashinka and Tamania are part of Australia's iconic voguing collective, the House of Slay. Together with their chosen mother, Benji Ra, they're challenging the way transgender and queer people of colour are seen all over the world. These are the things that I found in her room up the night after she tried to take her life. I mean, no, no mum wants to see their kids drawing these things. You don't want to see this. Why did you do these drawings? Because I wanted to die. How many of you boys and girls here today have been bullied? Based on our findings, we would say three Australians every week are taking their lives as a result of bullying. Every 15 minutes, a child is being bullied. Every day, more than 100,000 Australian students stay at home because they feel unsafe at school. Beautiful! Whoa! Finger high and so away. intense! If you're fighting in the streets, then this would be probably what you'd want. So how many is that? I don't think it's anyone's business to know how many guns I own. So basically what you're saying to me is that you have a lot of guns right here in your bedroom. You just don't want to tell me how many you actually have. Precise. You spent years wanting to beat, harm, even kill people like me, Arabs. Well, it wasn't just Arabs. Anyone that wasn't white? Well, because we couldn't like attack our own, could we? You know, but because like you guys were so small in the community, you know, it was an easy target for us, really. Like how violent did it get? Oh, you know, like I used to carry an axe, and a lot of the guys used to carry sledgehammers. You know, one of the guys had a bat with nails for it. A what, sorry? A baseball bat with nails put through it. Matthew Quinn is a self-described former leader of a white supremacist gang. In my days, I work as a doctor. Having the outlet of pup play gives me a recreation. I think that, that we all have animalistic passions. As humans, we are sexual animals. And my animal just happens to be a bit more German Shepherd. And I suppose that I want people to know that it's a normal community. I don't think that I should be hiding it away. What a relief to get that off. More than 70% of Australians are for marriage equality. That's a lot of people that disagree with your view. Sure. Is the Australian Christian Lobby perhaps just a little out of step? Uh, we may be, and, and maybe this plebiscite will show that. Brisbane Women's Correctional Prison have never allowed cameras inside until now. Please place your finger on the biometric reader. Identification successful. That was a bit like Space Odyssey. <laughs> I've got trapped in there so many times. My name is Stephen Boy, of course, not in your hands. Let's start with your name, Stephen This is Pat. Some of the mothers incarcerated here have been given permission to speak to us briefly. I wanted to understand why it was so difficult to turn away from this religion. So I tried everything I knew. Picked up the phone, called every contact I had, left messages on forums, went into the community and nothing. Literally nothing until this. Hi Pat, I'm one of the admins of the Underground X Muslim group. I wanted to organise a time to chat with you before we move forward. The message I received was from a young woman. She gave me an email and told me to wait for next instructions. It took some time, but this was my way in to the secret network of ex-Muslims. She dosed him in petrol and set him on fire. So your mother burnt your stepfather to death? Yes. 
I still don't believe it. And it's shocking that my mum murdered someone. Well, you can't go around saying that to people, that you're not allowed to talk about your sexuality in the, in the nursing home. How did that make you feel, Molly, being told that you couldn't be you? It, it just sent me back all those years ago to all these things that kept happening, you know, you can't be who you are. Just brought it all back to me. At the hands of family, she was subjected to more than six years of conversion therapy. I had electric shock treatment. Can I hold your hand? Yeah. Yes, well, it's digging up the past. It really is. Your hands are cold. I'm sorry, I'll warm them up. <laughs> what does having this support group for young gay Middle Eastern men, many of whom are not out, mean to you guys? What does it mean for you to be here tonight? We go through life like with our families who don't necessarily accept us. To have this kind of group, it changed my life. Some of these brave men are choosing to reveal their identities in the hope it'll save lives. There are other men out there looking for guidance, looking for support, and here we are today showing them that we exist. What we're doing here today is revolutionary. Well, Patrick Abud, everyone. <laughs> Oh, Patrick, I mean, just seeing those stories of people who are so often not seen on screen, whether they're, um, you know, queer seniors, queer people from religious or cultural backgrounds. Um, or white supremacists. Uh, Ex-white supremacists, <laughs> white supremacists, um, people in prison, um, people who are into pup and kink play. Um, it makes me think, like, you know, you spoke before about being an outsider to the industry and I guess we both come from underrepresented kind of backgrounds uh, to work in this space um, and that kind of background informs the work that you do but can we dig more into what your background is specifically and what those experiences were of growing up and the media that you saw tell us about that oh that's we need I think we need a whole day for that <laughs> um, I'll we try and have give you 40 minutes. The abridged, <laughs> my Snoopy watch is telling me I have 50 minutes. Um, the abridged version is, well, I mean, I guess you know this, and we've talked about it a lot too, um, for those that don't know, Ben and I are friends. Um, I didn't see myself on television at all growing up. I didn't see a reflection of my family. I didn't, I didn't hear that on the radio. I didn't read in the newspaper. I didn't see it in magazines. I literally did not see it. And, you know, that always it's always at the centre of my sort of ideas for stories now because there are always going to be those sorts of communities and those people who aren't heard. So I grew up in a um, Palestinian-Lebanese family. My family um, are incredible, they're everything to me and they struggled very, very much when I came out and I you know, have been very public about that in the last sort of five years or so but before that was very private about it um, and that last clip that you saw there is actually from a group of, it's a private group of young Middle Eastern men who are all kind of closeted and not out to mm. their families. It's a support group. And, you know, growing up in that environment where you're basically... So I go to school every day. I grew up out in Western Sydney, far Western Sydney, um, you know, in a sea of Anglo working class redneck Anglo people, basically, mm. who were incredibly racist. I was the only brown kid at school, etc., etc., etc. You can kind of tell the rest of the story yourself, I think. Um, and then that in conflict with, you know, being at home with my very Arab family, I didn't really fit into either. So I felt like I was always on the outer um, as a young Arab, but I was yeah. also on the outer as a young gay. Yeah. Um, and that was really difficult for, for a lot of reasons. But a lot of people told me you have to sort of belong somewhere. And that's what sort of has continuously inspired me to seek out these groups of people in these mm. communities that don't feel like that, that they don't feel like they belong because they're not often heard yeah. for who they are. So it was, a, it was a difficult journey, but where I'm at with my family now is extraordinary, and that's why I guess I'd still try and tell those stories, because there will be generation after generation 
more of those young people from communities like that that will go through the same thing. I guess being not at the centre of things, you know, wherever we are in whatever situation, you know, we're not the centred experience necessarily, um, and that can be both an asset and a liability. I wonder whether that also means that when you're coming in and working in the Australian media, that you might butt heads in terms of your perspectives with colleagues and bosses. Is, has that ever been the case for you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, very early on, uh, I'll just give one example. So part of the reason I never thought I could be a journalist mm. or, you know, didn't fit that box was because, one, I didn't see myself reflected when I was looking at the media yeah. when I was starting out. But secondly, because, you know, I was from Western Sydney, also I sounded different, I looked different, all those things. And one of the very first experiences I had was I went through... Um, I don't know how much I can give away, but basically I went through a process of getting going for a job and I got to the point where I had to do a voice test and the person that was employed by a very large broadcaster um, to do this voice test basically said to me, we need to train the ethnicity out of your voice. Wow. Yeah, and that was really confronting at the time. I, I took that on and I thought, okay, well, if this is how I'm going to get a job, then I better do that, you know? Mm. Um, now I think I should have said, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, but it's difficult when you're not in a position of power, when a gatekeeper is telling you this is mm. how things are done. I also believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you were also told to stay in the closet or advised to by colleagues. Is that right? Yeah, it wasn't so much... I think there was an in, it was inferred. Um, again, you know, someone with a lot of power, I guess, mm. uh, was the person having this conversation with me, and they were very diplomatic about the way they ran the conversation and the words that they chose to use. Um, but the inference was, yes, be very careful about, okay, you don't want to be a news journal and you don't want to sort of have this identity as the kind of, you know, the guy that stands back. You want to be involved, you want to be with people, you want to sort of, you know, bring stories out from these communities and really, you know, present that authentically. Um, but be careful because right. objectivity is, you know, the end game in, in journalism broadly speaking, and I think you can still be objective but still get close to the people that you're working with mm. and show some empathy, you know, and sensitivity. Well, look, that kind of advice about, you know, what you reveal of yourself or not is you're probably not the only person to have held, had that advice given to you from, from senior members of staff. Angeline Penrith is the performer who can recreate what some of that sounded like, at least in conversation with you. Listen, Pat, I'm not saying this to be prejudiced. I'm not a prejudiced person. What people do in their private lives is entirely their own business. But when you're in the public domain, when you're a journalist, you need to be objective, or at least have the appearance of objectivity. Um, the public don't want to know who the interviewer is. They want you to be their blank page um, onto which the interviewee can draw a picture of themselves. Um, if you're out, um, if they know you're a pufta, um, they're not going to believe you can be even-handed. Uh, and let's face it, Pat, it's not as bad as it used to be. <laughs> it used to be illegal until recently, so um, that's progress. Look, I'm not doing myself any favours saying this. I'm saying it because I want you to go far. I've seen what you can do. I've seen what it does. The cost is too high. Have your fun. Have your love affairs, just uh, keep it to yourself. Um, change is gradual. We have to be able to tolerate both sides of the argument. People need to be allowed to have their religious beliefs. Yes, I know those beliefs have actual murderous intent, and please don't start quoting act statistics on regional suicide to me. I'm on your side, you know. I'm one of the good guys. It's just not worth giving up your career to service this... Um, small part of who you are. Everyone has to deal with some pain, some rejection, some form of discrimination. You want to work in the mainstream media? That's the deal you make with the devil. Angeline Penrith, everyone. <laughs> Inhabiting some of the things you've heard and attitudes that I'm sure other people in the Australian media have encountered as well. How, how do you reflect on that now? 
hearing that is pretty intense. It's still really confronting. And I mean, obviously, that's the dramatized version. He didn't use the word pufta. Um, <laughs> but I knew very clearly what this person was trying to say. I mean, my response to that was, I didn't tell anybody. Mm. Um, I kept it to myself. I still don't think to this day I've ever told anybody about that. Maybe my sister. Um, mm. I think she's in the crowd. Maybe I told you about that at some point. Um, and why, why, why would My it? response was this. I mean, the, the, the response probably almost two years after that event was that I decided that I would say yes to hosting the Mardi Gras broadcast. Mm. And I would take that on. I would take on that role and be that guy because I was basically take, not taking any of the advice that this person had given to me, thinking that if I want to be able to be, if I want to tell authentic stories, I have to be authentic. Mm. How can I say I'm putting out authenticity with the storytelling that I make if I'm not authentic? And being someone who wants, the journalism that I create is personal. I want it to be personal because if I feel it, you'll feel it. You know, so that's the thing. I sort of went the, the other extreme. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm really happy that I did that. It was a big call to make in my family. It was sort of the same time I was coming out. It was, there was a lot of personal stuff going on in the background. But what it did was, it, you know, I got handwritten letters. I got messages sent to me from other young queer people around the country saying thank you. And, you know, that felt really great. It felt like I'd made the right decision. And that person who pulls the strings and is in power, actually many years after the event, congratulated me. Wow. So that's a really nice kind of full circle moment, you know? That's and incredible. sometimes you've got to be really, you just got to follow the instinct. And my so mum's always said that. Mum's advice always <laughs> works. So your instinct was the right one to basically resist and reject what this person had told you. At the same time, another one of your instincts, you said before, was to not necessarily tell anyone. And I think if I was presented with that situation, I wouldn't want to necessarily talk about it either, well, but I'm questioning weak. where that comes from. Where, where do you think weak. it comes from? I felt like I was, in a, I was disempowered immediately. This is a person who I looked up to, um, and I looked up to because I had found a way to work in the media landscape that was the way that I wanted, and I felt incredibly grateful for that, mm. and I don't take it for granted to this day. You know, I'm really, really lucky to to do what I do and to do it the way that I choose to do it. That's in a huge privilege. So I felt disempowered, but at the same time, you know, if I was to go and tell someone, I was concerned that it would completely derail this trajectory that I was on. And the media landscape we work in is very small. Again, it's changed massively. Like, I don't feel, I mean, I'm working with 10 now, which is, you know, it, it's a commercial network, which is something I never thought I'd do. Mm. I don't change anything about myself. I don't change the way I tell stories. I don't change the way I run an interview. I don't change the way I do an edit. The processes are different, but the authenticity that I hope, well, that I strive for, I feel like is still there. What so I, I won that battle. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I really love about seeing your career and the way that you talk about um, the stories that you've told, but also your own story, is it seems like your personal trajectory is kind of dovetailing with your professional one, right? Um, the way that you've been able to be authentic in your own life and within the professional realm has kind of like been braided. Um, and you did mention before that in the last five years you've been more public about your sexuality, the importance of diversity and the way in which you came out and what that's been like for your family. Um, in fact, your mum, I believe, wrote you a letter about it and she made it public and that was quite a remarkable moment. Um, and Angeline Penrith is going to come out again and read that letter for us. My darling baby boy, Pat. Well, not so much a baby anymore. A beautiful grown-up man. But as the youngest in our family, you'll always be my baby son. When you came out and told me that you are gay, I got hysterical, as at the time, I didn't understand it and thought it was your choice to be that way. I wasn't educated about it. People said it was a shame to our Arabic community and society didn't accept it. I struggled inside for a very long time, but I started searching, learning, and talking to professional people about it until I understood 
the way I needed to. That gay people don't have a choice to be how they are. They are God's beautiful creations and there shouldn't be any discrimination against them. In fact, I found after meeting your beautiful partner and some of your gay and lesbian friends that they are more loving and caring for others than most. I love you and your partner and your friends and the way you always look after each other. You are like family and that's everything to us in our culture. The government needs to stop with their discrimination. We are all equals and we all deserve to be treated equally, no matter what. I will continue to fight for this, for you and your loving partner and your wonderful friends, to be treated with respect and dignity you all deserve. I am very proud of you, so proud to see how you have created your own path, your self-respect and your compassion for others. You take care of so many others and you are so giving. Everything you do is with such compassion for others and you really go out of your way to make others' lives better. That makes me so proud. I'm also so proud of all you continue to achieve. You shine with success in everything you do and, and you look very handsome on te television. Son, I will always have my mind and heart open to all the rights that you deserve as a human being. I hope we will continue to work together to keep peace and justice in the world. I will always support you in any time you need my support. And I will always support the LGBT community. Love is the biggest power of all. And no matter what happens, what anyone says, I love you so much. Love is our leader. Stay strong and keep smiling and keep your head held high. Love, Mum. Oh. I can barely look at you because <laughs> I think I'm going to start crying. Um, <laughs> you know, what I, what I sense in that letter is um, your mum's palpable and fierce love for you. Um, but I think we just all fell in love with your mother just in that yeah. moment um, as My well. My mum is extraordinary. Like, she's genuinely, I think people say this about their mums, but my mum is the most incredible person I've ever had the privilege of knowing. And she just continues to, like, surprise me all the time. Your mother is so extraordinary, and that letter is such a remarkable kind of document and, and, and testament about her and you, your relationship, and a moment in time. I guess it also makes me think that when we saw the video before, it also reminds me that not everyone necessarily has that family experience. Does that kind of remind you of what's at stake when you go and do some of those stories? Yeah, of course. I mean, mum has always taught me two things, three things actually, not two, three things. Um, the first one is integrity. She's always instilled this value of integrity as being something that is not you, you never compromise on that. Mm. No matter what, you do not compromise on that. Humility is the second thing. She's always said that it's really important no matter how, how big things get, how great things feel, how much money you earn, or how many, whatever it is, all the good things, you know, there's always going to be someone else that needs more, that yeah. needs help, that needs to be noticed. So, you know, being humble about your achievements is really important and don't take them for granted. And honesty is the third thing. I'm holding back the tears, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I always get emotional when I talk about my mum because it's been such a long journey. And that is because where my parents come from, you know, I'm doing, I'm organising another event at the moment for Mardi Gras and um, it's part of a sort of bigger project called Gay Arabia. And the point of that is it's something that I've, you know, it's been at the centre of my life for so long because it is my life but more so where my parents come from, as I was saying, it, it's still a matter of life or death to be out and to be who you are and to present yourself the way you choose in terms of your, you know, your identity. Um, really recently, there was a concert in Egypt where a bunch of young people raised a rainbow flag. Because of that, they were imprisoned, they were kept in solitary confinement, they were electrocuted. It was insane that that happened less than two years ago in Egypt, like that's, that's now. Um, the way that affects young people here from our community is 
that those ideals are carried forward, you know, that parents have those same ideals. It's not because they're bad people or our community is this kind of sinister, you know, horrible world. I mean, Arab hospitality and the Middle Eastern region generally is one of the most beautiful parts of the world. I've lived there, I've experienced it. But there's this thing, this kind of set of values that are attached to being gay that just haven't reconciled yet. So there are many people here that are going through what I went through 10 years ago, you mm. know, even five years ago. Just this morning, actually, I got my hair cut, and the guy that cuts my hair is a young Lebanese guy who's just come out to his parents wow. two weeks ago. And, you know, their first response was, it's okay, we'll get you a psychiatrist. It's okay, we'll fix you. Um, you know, don't hang around with those people anymore. Mm. We can help you. I've been hearing that for the last decade. You know, my, I mean, my parents reacted like that in the beginning. And then, you know, you hear that letter, it's taken them a decade to get there. So it's a really genuine struggle um, that still continues for many. So I won't stop telling those stories because, again, you know, making that call to front the Mardi Gras and do those kind of stories that I did when I was at SBS, again, a huge privilege. If I have that platform, why would I not use it? Yeah. You know, those families will see that. They, even, if, even if one mind gets changed, there's this sort of tribal mentality in our community that if, you know, in Arabic you say, like everyone will talk to each other. And eventually, that'll break down. Yeah. I'm the world's biggest idealist, I know, I'm a dreamer. <laughs> but you've got, to, you've got to try. Yeah. Um, look, it does make me think you've come such a long way and your family has as well. Um, and it also reminds me of a story in your own life about you picking up your first issues of the Star Observer, the iconic queer press uh, from Newtown. And in fact, Angeline is going to share that experience of you in your youth now. I picked up my first copy of the Star Observer from the old fish records on King Street in Newtown. I was 17. I'd speed read through it, searing in my mind every frame I could of gay images and every gay word on every one of those newspapers' gay pages. In minutes, sometimes seconds later, I'd put it straight back down and run away, and I'd run with a palpable sense of fear. Fear of losing my family, fear of losing myself, fear of being found out. I lived a very sheltered life in Western Sydney growing up in an Arabic-speaking family. Back then, in some parts of the Arab world, homosexuality was still punishable by imprisonment, even death. In fact, it still is in 13 countries. Many of my parents' generation came to Australia bringing those interpretations of homosexuality with them. My own ignorance, coupled with dread, forced me to suppress my sexuality. In my time with the Star Observer, was my little secret to myself. Sometimes my only solace was that trip to Newtown, which I made often, each time with the anticipation of what I'd learn and the same fear of what I could lose. I was so deeply locked into a dark closet. We've come a long way, but no matter how many wins we achieve in our fight for equality, to glimpse into my own story is a gentle reminder that there will always be a young person out there on a journey of self-discovery. Thank you, Angeline. With, with your words there, Patty, and, um, you know, when you put your words out there, I think part of the deal, whether we like it or not, as public figures, as storytellers, as journalists, is that we get feedback. Um, and I think <laughs> sometimes that feedback manifests as abuse, as, as hate, and I don't think I'm wrong when I say that is compounded when you are a woman, and it's compounded yep. if you are a minority, someone from a marginalised or underrepresented background. Do you get haters? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Many. Um, I think with, if you're going to put something out in the public domain, whatever it is, there's going to be people who like it, yep. who identify with it, who it resonates with in some way, and there's going to be others who think you're an absolute wanker, hate what you've got to say, 
don't want to borrow of it. I mean, I find some of that stuff like really easy to dismiss and deflect. It's like, well, that person's an idiot. That person obviously has issues that has nothing to do with me. But then so some stuff sticks. Uh, what's the stuff that stuck with you and why? Yeah. I think it's important. So, I mean, it's important to acknowledge constantly, like you said, that we're, we're here speaking from a huge place of privilege, right? You know, we have these platforms. We have the ability to, to tell stories in the ways that we do. Um, that hopefully affects people in some way, in a positive way, and makes some change somewhere along the way. Um, one, one example I can think of right now in this moment that you've asked the question is um, delivering the results of the plebiscite marriage mm -hmm. quality survey. I was standing next to Magda Sabansky in, um, in the park at Redfern. I don't know the name of the park, but you know that park. Yeah, uh, <laughs> like, like Prince Alfred Park? Prince Alfred Park. Yep. And you know, there's a stage here, there's this kind of gorgeous sea of people, my kind of queer family, basically, um, from all walks. It was really beautiful. And looking out at that and this kind of anticipation, and it was, my heart was pounding. And Magda and I were just kind of like whispering each other, oh my fucking God, oh my fucking God, oh my fucking God. Let's, what if it's no, yeah. you know? So, and we didn't know, we were literally waiting for it to pop up on a TV screen. And as I saw the kind of 61% come up, both Mary and I just had this huge like, sigh of relief. Mm. Um, and obviously there was the 40 odd percent remaining. And uh, later on when I'd found out that the bulk of that was from Western Sydney and from these communities, um, I was concerned because uh, this is the thing, I've always sort of walked that fine line, like I said before, sort of left foot in the community, right foot in sure. the media, right? Um, and interestingly, I got haters from both sides. Like, I got a text message that night, um, and having had this incredible, you know, day, I was so elated, the text message basically said, you're a traitor. It was from a gay person in the community I'd work with. Wow. Um, you know, sort your people out. Basically. Wait a minute, just to clarify, sort your people out, Who's the, which community so is this person, person had, from and which community this, is he this talking is a, about? This is a person who identifies as gay, who I'd work with um, you know, many times, and they basically called me a traitor because I'm, they know I'm from Western Sydney. So like, sort your people out, it's my responsibility wow. to go and transform that 40%'s perspective and get them to... That's enough to make you a traitor, just coming from uh, yeah, a community. Yeah, so there's, you know, that, that, that person, instantaneously became a hater, but before that, Pat, he was an ally. How can you work for those bigots anymore, Pat? You're a traitor if you continue working with them. I mean, I put my neck on the line, arguing with my family. You need to take responsibility for what your community has done. I mean, how come when they're prejudiced, and I say so, I'm a Western Sydney basher, but when I'm prejudiced, and you say so, I'm supposed to just suck it up. I mean, two-way street, Pat, two-way street. Why should I put my energy into changing these people when they're ignorant, uneducated, and they're, and they're never going to change? Hmm? Ah. Okay, so that, those are some examples of messages and sentiments that you actually got. Yeah. And I imagine some of them were in a private forum, maybe some of them were public. Twitter, you, text message. How do you begin to respond and personally process that, that sort of stuff? Honestly, I don't. A lot of the time, I don't. Recently, I got kind of, you know, very publicly heckled. This Friendly Geordies did a takedown of something that I did on the project. And just, friendly... just to clarify, Friendly Geordies is a YouTuber who's associated with the Labor Party, but has also built a reputation of trolling certain media personalities as well. Yeah, little twat. Um, but my partner, who was very protective, and you know, he he was like, "I'm going to take this guy down. I'm going to tell him what, you know, he needs to, he needs to hear." And you know, that's really beautiful because obviously it's coming from a protective place. But my first instinct is you never respond to those people yeah. because it's what they want. And the interesting thing about that example is I got it from the other side. Mm -hmm. So you know, I have to deal with like the Arab community and just more broadly the community in Western Sydney who. And I'm not talking about our generation, I'm talking about elders mm. who still hold on to some of those bigoted views because that's just what they know. It's not because, again, it's not because they're terrible people and they mean ill harm. It's a whole different kind of value system that they've been raised with. Mm. It's really important to say that as well. And then, you know, from the queer community, it's like, where do, who do you belong to? Where do you belong to? I feel like that's been a consistent um, question that I get asked. And 
you know, very early on when I was starting off in, in journalism, as, as you said before, I was sort of told that I have to specialise, or I have to sort of, you know, create something so people understand what it is that I do. And I didn't do that, and in, in the same vein, I don't really do that with these sort of allegiances that I create with the different worlds that I work and move between. I think it's great that that can happen, because that's how those unique stories come from within those communities, and then all of a sudden you've got these disparate groups of people that are connecting and they don't realise that they're being connected. Mm. And that's at the crux of pretty much everything I've tried to do. It's sort of like, you think this about that group of people, but actually have you ever had a conversation with anyone from that group? Mm. Do you know anything about them? If I tell a story from this group, you might see it, you'll hear it from their mouth, and your mind might change. So you see part of your job, because you come from such a unique background and position of intersectionality, that you can kind of be a mediator or a channel between two ostensibly opposing groups? That's a great descriptor. I totally feel like a mediator. Like, often I will... I, nev I never really was in front of the camera. I mean, I started off as a BJ kind of shooting myself, and I always was behind the camera. Um, that just sort of happened over time, but I often still even now that I'm in front of the camera, I'll often try and move out of the way as much as possible. Mm. Particularly when you're making long-form documentary, you know, like, it's got to be about the people that you're with. You're, you're there because you want people to get a really authentic perspective on what their lives are like, what their struggles are, what their hopes are, um, who they are as people. So that, that judgment and those misconceptions that people often have of communities they don't understand slowly dissipate. Again, I know it's kind of an idealistic perspective, but I really do think that the power of storytelling is huge. Mm. It's, you know, it's infinite. Um, my parents wanted me to be a lawyer. My oldest brother was a lawyer. Of course, you know, your parents <laughs> wanted you to be a doctor. <laughs> sure. Um, here we are, sitting on the stage of Town Hall. But, you know, I've always been interested in this idea that you can make change in some way. And the change is that whatever we can do to kind of help each other understand one another better, we're all going to be better off in the end, mm. right? I mean, you're talking about change, and I also wonder whether, to what extent are you, through your work, changing or challenging preconceived ideas of what journalism is and should be? Like, for instance, I think there is still this kind of, like, broad and maybe dominant idea that when approaching subjects in story matter, you are the neutral bystander, that you can't grow emotionally attached to the subjects to whom you're talking, that you cannot invest your own personal experience or perspectives into the story itself. But it strikes me that you're doing something that's quite different. I mean, are you trying to challenge perceived assumptions about what this kind of storytelling should be? I don't think that was ever intentional. To, you know, that's my absolutely um, frank answer. I don't think that was ever intentional. But that conversation you heard earlier with, you know, this sort of big um, boss, basically, um, at one point, that's that's sort of where that came from. This idea that was planted in my mind that you have to behave in a certain way in order to be a respected journalist. Mm. I just did not feel that that was just didn't sit well with me at all. And over time, I realised that. Okay, I'm naturally an empathetic person, and I think that that comes from my mum and from my upbringing and from my family and the values as, you know, growing up in a really rich Arab family. Um, there's no harm in showing that empathy. Mm. And if you do give the sense of this person or this group of people that you're spending time with, interviewing, filming with, I mean, they're giving me access to their lives. How can I not be personal? You know, I'm not going to stand back and, and sort of have zero emotion and be removed. A good example, I think, is that clip there from... Um, that story was about um, basically discrimination in nursing homes and LGBT elders really struggling with that, and there being no policy around it, essentially. Still till now, there isn't really policy around it, sadly. But Malloy, the wonderful woman I was interviewing, I mean, if I took the advice of that person that said, don't, don't get you know, keep objectivity or whatever. My objectivity wasn't lost in that story because I reached my hand out. She was struggling and I felt her pain. And I still feel it talking about it. If I'm feeling that in the moment, there's no harm in expressing that because mm. I think it gives a sense of comfort to that person that you're interviewing. And, and I imagine result, it gives the audience access to what that moment is. And that it's real, that's what I'm getting at. The, the, it's real. If I just sat there and watched her cry, I mean, A, I'd be a terrible person. And, you know, maybe you do that and not include it in your cut and your edit, but 
that's how it played out for me. So why wouldn't I present that to the audience? Because again, it's the authentic experience. And I think that that's beautiful. So, so much about your work and the work of any kind of real life storyteller, like non-fiction storyteller, is about getting access and gaining trust. For you, what are the steps to doing that? Like on, in a practical, almost nerdy sense when it comes <laughs> to approaching stories and subjects. There's no rule book on this, it's really difficult. And I often, when I've done you know, talks with students and um, stuff like that, this is always the question. So how, do you get, how did you get those people that are into like, pup play to like, let you spend a week with them? <laughs> well, if you there know? aren't any rules, can you give us a case study? I mean, the pup play one's interesting. Like, tell us about that, a fetish community. Honestly, it's genuinely, it's, it, it's natural curiosity. Mm. If I make a phone call, if I find something and I look at a community and I think, I really want to understand why this group of people are into this thing, or why they think that way, or why they're putting this certain message out. Like, Lyle Shelton is a good example, you know, the ex-head of the Australian Christian Lobby. I watched him like a hawk, because he is the reason, and that sentiment is the reason that, you know, young LGBTQI people are four times more likely to commit suicide, which, I mean, that's even higher now. That, that mm. was a few years ago, that's gone up, even more so in regional areas. Like, watching someone like that, I was just fascinated by the way his mind works. So he doesn't want me to interview him because he knows exactly where I stand, right? He doesn't want to be interviewed. Does he deserve your empathy? He does, and this is the thing. He doesn't deserve... No, let me take that back. He doesn't deserve um, my empathy, but he deserves my respect. Mm. Right? I think they're two different things. I didn't empathize with him because I didn't agree with his position, but we can agree to disagree. So that, the way that interview played out in the end, I shook his hand afterwards and said, thank you for being really honest with me. Because often he wasn't. Mm. You know, you'd see him on the t you see these grabs and these sound bites, and you didn't really understand the person behind the issue and what he stood for. So what I'm saying there is that I understand his value system and the way that he was raised and all the kind of things that are true to him are very different to mine. Mm. And I mean, I, I'm still processing this, and I'm not sure I have the answer, but is it still okay to agree to disagree when there's so much at stake? Here's the thing. Putting someone like him on the television is A, so you can really challenge his perspective. And I think if you go back and watch that interview, I felt really good about it because I did really challenge his perspective. Mm. And the point of doing that is to show people that are taking his perspective on that it's flawed. Mm. So I can agree to disagree with him, but hopefully the people out in the public domain will question even further. Mm. So it's about setting up that pattern of questioning for people. Don't take it verbatim. Don't take what this person's saying as it is. Look further, ask more questions. Mm -hmm. And the point of getting access is that sense of natural curiosity is about just being really honest with what you want to do. You don't pick up the phone and say, um, you know, hey, I'm doing XXX and I'd really like to promote this thing that you're doing, whatever. It's more like, hey, I just read this article about pup play and it sounds completely bizarre <laughs> and really fascinating. Like, can you talk to me about it? Mm. That's it. And that's how the conversation starts. And I mean, I guess I'm lucky because I've done quite a lot of that over the years. I've, I can send things to people and say, look, I spent time with this group. This is what came of it. Mm. And then there's this sort of trust and rapport that you build over time where people don't, they trust that you're not going to take the piss and you're not going to misrepresent them and that you are going to actually give them a platform to tell the story the way they want it told. And then because you're telling stories that sometimes deal with trauma, that sometimes deals with real pain, um, I'm wondering what the duty of care is to yourself. Because yesterday um, I was having a similar conversation with Walkley Award-winning photojournalists uh, Nick Moyer and Sylvia Leiber, and they were immersed and got awards for um, their coverage of the catastrophic bushfires last summer. That was an incredibly traumatic thing to cover, but it created its own kind of traumas for the people capturing it as well. What do you do to make sure that you are emotionally protected, that you have the strength to keep doing the work that you do? God help my partner and my family. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think that's a really, really, really tricky one. I don't think I've been very good at doing that, and mm -hmm. I speak very frankly about it. I've burnt out. Um, you know, I've gotten to points where it just got like too much mm -hmm. and then I've stood back. But I've learned over the years that there's this idea of um, 
transfer trauma, I think is the expression that psychologists use. And it's a real thing. I mean, I was always a little bit like... Transferring from the subject to you? To, to the person who's, you know, spending time you. with them. Yeah, right. and you don't realise it in the moment, but a good example is, you know, going to, to Christchurch, say, and, you know, being put on a plane last minute when a horrible terrorist attack occurred. I really genuinely struggled through that. Yeah. I genuinely struggled through it. I was in the family of, you know, a, Muslim family's home, I understood the traditions, I understood the family background, they just lost their mother, a wife. It was really difficult because I saw so much of my own family playing out in front of my eyes. And I didn't really do anything afterwards. Um, I did speak up about it and I think it wasn't dealt with really well with the people that were managing that process at the time. That's a whole other story. But what it did to teach me in that moment was I really do need to A, talk about it, mm. Um, you know, B, find ways to get some sort of respite. And I think for me, my mind never stops. But if I take a walk and do a hike, and my partner and I love hiking, which has been a really awesome respite, he, you know, really sort of got me into that. And um, swimming is another thing that I find really great. It's not that my mind stops, it's just that it helps me think about things in a different way. Mm. So it's really incredibly important. I can't say that enough to any younger journos in the audience. That the impact is huge. The impact going outward can be really vital, you know, especially with this investigative project I've been working on for three years of my life. It's taken over every thought I have. You know, mm. I'm always thinking about it and I'm so in it, but I have ways to basically step back from it and, and say to myself, there's only so much you can do. And if there are things that are bothering you about, I did 47 interviews um, in two months for that project. It's a lot, mm. and it's a really, it's a, it's a story that has a lot of trauma attached. Um, I actually, you know, I caught up and I made an appointment with a psychologist afterwards and had a conversation mm. because I realised that I needed to do that. So it is a very real thing, and there's no reason at all to be, um, you know, to shy away from that. It's important to put your hand up and say, I actually just can't handle hearing any more trauma, yeah. and it's sunk too deep. And I think there's a sort of blurred line between wanting to really help the person or the people or the community that you're telling stories from and then also look after yourself so you can keep doing it. Yeah. You're talking about um, your investigative uh, new podcast project that you're working on at the moment. Are we allowed to say the title of it yet? Um, yeah, we're allowed to say the title. So the title is The Greatest Menace. And what are you allowed to tell us about The Greatest Menace? And also, when can we listen to it? Good old Jeff Bezos, Amazon, uh, <laughs> pre prevents me from telling you much <laughs> until it's released. Um, so yeah, it's basically, the, the, the most I can tell you is that it's something I've been working on with my co-producer, Simon Kunick, who's an, an incredible storyteller um, and someone I trust with my life. We've been working so closely together for a long time now. Um, it'll actually be four years in August this year. So it's a long time to invest in one thing. And we did it because it's a really important story. I think um, the New South Wales government will have a lot to say when it drops. Um, there are things that have occurred in our past that should absolutely never have occurred. And I want to make sure, as does Simon, those things become known. Mm. And in some sense, I hope that it will rewrite our queer history specifically, because it's a very queer story. Mm. Um, it's, it's basically about a gay prison in a tiny Australian town. Wow. A gay prison in a tiny Australian I mean, I, I want to know more, and I want to ask you more, but we're about to run out of time. But that will be called The Greatest Menace, and people will be able to hear it soon enough um, and when you do you'll year. know who's responsible so midway this year um, Patrick Abud thank you so much for your generosity and candor and your generosity of work as well can you please join me in thanking Patrick thank you thanks for coming out <laughs> appreciate you being here coming out here and coming out to your families <laughs> yeah. as well. Um, thank you so much for being a great audience and please also keep uh, your applause up for Angeline Penrith for her wonderful Woo! moments of performance today. Angeline, thank you so much.
The writer and director of Walkley's Live is Alana Valentine. I'm Benjamin Law. Please do book for one of our other great sessions of Walkley's Live, the journalist Gene. Same time tomorrow, I will be speaking to journalist Chris Reeson about terror on the ground, the Lint siege, uh, the Lint Cafe siege. Um, please join us then. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Hello.